collective ways, we display the kind of um, the community that we belong to. We, we can we project these political parties. Um, you see the red shirts that we were talking about this morning, Fredland and East Timor, um, through universities, schools, colleges, in all kinds of ways. We show, we want to show the community that we belong to. And when we um, talk about ways of, of bringing these kinds of ideas of community into the classroom with, teach, with students, these might be some of the ways you, you think about how, what kind of identity do you belong to or community? And how do you show that to other people? People, how do you identify yourselves in terms of your representation? Um, sometimes, of course, identities can be uh, imposed on you, perhaps by uniforms, which isn't isn't something new. If we if we think of mill workers in law in the 19th century, these these women clearly identified in the kind of dress that they were, kind of work that they did. But we can transfer over to Thai factories or Cambodian textile factories, where again a uniform shows a community of people, not necessarily your desire to join that community particularly, but their 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 appearance. You can tell where they belong. I I um uh, I did Thai sorry, I did Tai Chi in, in Singapore and we had this really wonderful, wonderful teacher from from uh, Shanghai, who got uh, from Beijing, who got you know, top honours in the Tai Chi uh, school, but she had a little emblem here saying she belonged in Chinese, saying that this, this is where she graduated from, and her assistant also graduated from that. So the two of them were there, but unfortunately, they we days a lot of construction in Singapore. Unfortunately, these little badges were resembled some of the firms that were building and so somebody asked her what construction company she belonged to. <laughs> Sometimes these representations can be, can be misleading. But um, I'd like to turn to that to think about um, community identity and localization in Southeast Asia because as most of you know, this is a a very diverse region in terms of language, ethnic identity, ethnicity is, as Paul explained to you this morning, a very problematic term, but I'm going to use it anyway. In terms of your um, your community identity, and there's about estimated 6,000 languages or so in the world, um, but a thousand of them are spoken in Southeast Asia, and underneath that big umbrella are lots of dialects that are so different from each other that they could be languages as well. So language has been an important sign of, or important indication of identity, but it also raises the question of, of um, multiculturalism. And multiculturalism is a kind of a buzzword in, in the West, and we, I think, more or less generally understand what a multicultural society might start to look like. We haven't got there yet. Um, in the United States, English is still the main language. Um, the Senate begins its proceedings with a Christian prayer. Uh, so we're still on the, but there's still a kind of an idea that the United States is, a, is moving towards a multicultural country. Could you still sing the Star Spangled Banner in Spanish? Well, I ask my students that in Hawaii, 50-50, you know, there's a the jury still out, but still. Now, the whole idea of multiculturalism is much more problematic in countries that are really um, trying to affirm their identity and where the nation state, as we understand it, is a relatively new phenomenon. Uh, and where the creation of that modern nation state has been linked to the dominance of a particular ethnic group, a particular religion, and a particular language. And the, the Thai case that Paul mentioned is, is, is a very obvious case that the three pillars of Thai society are Buddhism, the language, and reverence for the veneration of the king. So if you're not in that, 
you're a Muslim to the southern Thailand or some animist group in the hill tribe, it's, it's, uh, it, it's difficult to fit you into that, that kind of framework. So in countries where, where such as Myanmar, where Burmese dominate, or Malaysia, where the Malays are on top, uh, it's, it's the idea of multiculturalism is, is somewhat different, and yet it has the idea of this unified multicultural state where uh, everybody is on an equal footing has nonetheless become what, what people purport is happening. And an example you can see is in the case of Vietnam, where if you go to any national museum in Vietnam, they're going to have 54, uh, 54 uh, models all with their national, their, their ethnic dress on. And the, the mantra is, and this is uh, from a, a Vietnamese website, um, Vietnam is a culturally diversified country with 54 different groups of people living in harmony with each other. Um, we had a, 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 a village of cultural community of ethnic groups. We had a show. It was a good chance to honor the cultural diversification. Was to remind us of the responsibility to preserve cultural and unique values of the various ethnic groups in the whole community. Uh, that was the first time such a show was held. The 54 ethnic group traditional costume show was successful and made a good impression on the attendance. Um, so this this paragraph, uh, official announcement about the show, uh, of course, could be contested. Um, the, um, the, are the values unique? Are they, um, uh, at this Vietnam, we really supporting cultural diversification? And there, uh, nonetheless, this, this representation of the modern Southeast Asian state as a community, a combined community, where there are lots of interesting ethnic groups, so come and visit us as a tourist, we'll show you a good time, you can enjoy that. It's become part of a whole contemporary modernization. And so it's, it's, it's made representations of dress and your ethnicity assume a different kind of a value from they had in the past. So now they're a value to the, the government because they log into this idea of multiculturalism and they attract tourists as, as well. But I want to turn now from the present from this kind of, and in some case, cases faked representation of, of ethnic dress, to think about representations of the body in the past and representations of the body in the way that they related to identity. Uh, so, um, it's, if we think about these kinds of representations, I think we can think about mapping Southeast Asia in a different kind of a way that overcomes this whole problem um, that Paul referred to this morning of teaching by countries. Of course, that's the way that people relate to. But I think our job as teachers is to explain, as, again, as Paul made so clear this morning, that these borders are constructed in a historical context, they were constructed with certain goals in mind, and they don't necessarily make cultural sense. And if we think in terms of a more localised kind of mapping, then we might have a very different perspective. And even when you think, well, I'm going to ask you, everybody, to wear a long little uh, a long t-shirt, for example. There are still ways in which individuals, even with their all wearing, wearing an address that clearly identifies them as a community, to make their own personal impact, to, to show that they, they, they can express themselves. When I was a teacher in, in that, 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 that mecca of, of education, the New South Wales Department of Education, but anyway, I was there. Um, so I taught in a school where the girl, everybody had to wear uniforms. It was amazing. It was a public school. Amazing how the kids 
were able to express their own personality with their uniform. They put their belts down, or they pull them tight, or they put their socks up. There'd be a fashion at the time for letting your socks slip down your ankles. So, even within this broad umbrella of community identity and representation through dress, through body adornment, whatever, there can be. It's not a. It's not high bound. It's not something where individuals can't, can't show themselves. So that's. Um, so that's the way I'm trying to uh, approach Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia today. So, um, and I think it makes it possible to think more comparatively across the region when we think of different ways of presenting the body. So I'd like to pick up as a historian a few examples, three areas where I think this kind of personal stroke community representation can be displayed. And the first area I'm, I'm thinking about is the head. We can do lots of things with heads. We have lots of bits and pieces sticking out that can be changed or, or modified, but more, um, more particularly, of course, is the head in most cultures has a special significance. In, in Southeast Asia in particular, it's often considered the site where um, special, special powers or personality, you never pat somebody in the head. But in Western society, it's quite possible to ruffle somebody's hair as a sign of affection. Or, uh, so the, the meaning of the head could be explored cross culturally does it mean? And then what do you do with your head to show where you belong? So we can do all kinds of things. Um, I mean, some of you are old enough, like me, to remember the era of the Beatles mm -hmm. and the way the Beatles cut their hair. So that caused such, and even before that, Elvis, these kind of, we used to call them Australian bodgies and widgies. The, the bodgies were the boys who put their hair back in an Elvis style and immediately you did that, you were locking into a certain kinds of community. But we can, we can change the way we, uh, we get around our noses, we can do things with our ears, with our teeth. Um, you know, all these can be changed and modified, but we do these in a cultural context, right? We, we, we don't just, there's room for individuality, but we're still taking models and examples from somewhere else. So let me, let me look first at teeth. Okay, so I've got three examples here. On, the, on this side, you see a Balinese woman going through the ritual of teeth fighting. Actually, they're not fighting, it's just a little scraping where they straighten the teeth along the bottom. Um, and mostly July or August is the ritual time for, for teeth filing. It's a very elaborate ceremony. Um, you can see this, this girl is, is very elaborately dressed. Uh, there's special practitioners who carry that, that out. Um, it's believed that, that tooth, this tooth filing will release all kinds of uh, passions uh, that are unacceptable of, of uh, anger, uh, jealousy, those sorts of things, but also I think the more the deeper historical underlay is that it, it distances human beings from animals. The, the animals have fangs and funny teeth. I mean, they pointed teeth. But if you straighten straighten the teeth along the bottom, it's not only aesthetically pleasing, but it also emphasises your your a position in a, an identity of human beings as opposed to to animals. But it could also, as this um, this Baja woman from the southern Philippines shows, you could see that her teeth have been all decorated with gold. It doesn't mean that these are gold fillings. It doesn't mean that she's they've been deliberately overlaid with, with gold. That's a sign of her wealth and her status, and also when she was younger of great, of beauty. It's not something that we would value today. Uh, and for us, uh, white teeth are, are what makes a person 
beautiful. And you could see that here in these, um, and this will need, it's not hard to see well, but she, all her teeth are dyed black. Um, with, you, can, you can dye it, there's, there's various kinds of roots and, and uh, dyes that you can permanently dye your teeth black. And that was common through much of Southeast Asia, even well into the 19th century, and this is a 20th century picture, of seeing black teeth as a sign of beauty, but also as a sign of your affiliation with a certain uh, uh, ethnic group, which is, was different in this case. By the time this woman's um, teeth were black, were black and in 1909, lowland Christian Filipinos would not be have black teeth. Christian Filipinos were all be very far along the road to Hispanization, Westernization, and you can see that in Malay literature as well, whereas early Malay literature talks about a beautiful woman, her teeth as black as a bumblebee's wings. <laughs> but by the late 19th and early 20th century, the literature was talking about teeth as white as pearls. So there's an aesthetic change as well. But teeth can be an important indication of, of, um, of ethnic, for example, as teeth parting, of course, doesn't occur in in Java. You know, it's, it's very much related. So, um, and I'd like to think about ears. Ears, of course, is also a place where you can display your uh, sense of community. And again, it comes back to this whole idea of multiculturalism and the incorporation of dis di different ethnic groups. Because if you look at these pictures, you can see that they're all tribal. Um, so this uh, a Chin woman with um, a, from uh, um, upland Myanmar with earplugs and she's decorated with flowers. This is another Korean woman with earplugs. The ears are very easy because there's no nerve endings here. You can do lots of things with your earlobes and it doesn't, it's not, not too bad. Um, the, these these um, Kalabic um, men and women, you can see these. I like this one because they're, it's, this was taken just a couple of years ago, but these women are all dressed up in their finery, but they've still got their long, their long hanging earlobes. And the, the, the distinction, you can find it in, say, Myanmar uh, chronicles, where they say, you know, we the Burmese are surrounded by these long-eared people, you know, that they see these long-eared people as somebody some different, some different ethnic group from them. So, decoration of ears can be a, a very um, uh, significant aesthetic change because what's happening in Calabit society up there a few years ago, people are now, you can have a little operation, you can cut off the ear here so that you only have a short ear. So a lot of people have done that under pressures of modernization. They've, they've shorten their, their ear so that they don't have, have these long ears anymore. And of course, the younger generation, the younger clubs, won't, won't do this anymore. So the whole representation of the body, um, in, particularly in this Kalavik group, um, is, is well documented but changing also because of the pressures of of modernization, again, which I'll come back to later on. Um, so, next one. What's interesting about nose piercing, it's not very prevalent in Southeast Asia as a whole. This, what, this picture is from New Guinea, where it's, it's very common, and I, I, I was trying to find out why do most of Southeast Asia, if anyone has an example, I'd be very interested. Whereas India, you often find jewels in the nose and so forth. It's very, quite rare. I don't see that in Southeast Asia very much. Um, and I don't, certainly don't see this kind of, of decoration in the rest of, of Southeast Asia. New Guinea is, in a, in a way, a separate area, a bit more Melanesian. And, uh, but, but nonetheless, you can see here, this, this clearly marks him off as a a member of a certain group, but the, the, the bird of paradise feathers that he had. So each, each 
tribal group will have its own way of decorating and putting the feathers on of decorating it. So I can't tell specifically which community it comes from, but certainly if I were Danny, I would know which there, which area, which village that he comes from, and the, the, the way that the, the headdress is organized, I would be able to tell that as well. Uh, and this is this is the part of the picture that, that Paul showed you this morning, if you remember King Mongkut and his chief queen. This is one of his um, concubines, one of the children, mothers perhaps of his many children, the one that, that Paul showed you. Uh, but you can see how the, the, the hair is, is here. And it's, that was a Thai style. We don't find Thai women wearing their hair like that nowadays. But that was certainly how it was until recent times. But this is interesting, this um, because it was quite different from the Burmese. The Burmese had long, long hair. And when the Burmese went into battle against um, against the, the Mons who lived in the southern Burmese, they would take down their hair so that you could see in battle who was a Burmese and who was a Mon by the, their long hair. So the Burmese had long hair and this this Woman here um, was one of the another favourite concubine of King of, of King Chu, along with the, the the son of this the, the son of this guy here, um, very important king. But she came from Chiang Mai in the, what is now northern Thailand, which was controlled by the Burmese for a long, long, long time. And so there's a lot of Burmese influence there. And so when she was brought to the court as a concubine from Chiang Mai, or given to the court as a Chong, she kept her hair long. You can't see it here in this picture, but there's a whole series of photographs which she herself allowed to happen, which show her in her bedroom with this long hair. And it's clear she wanted to maintain her status in, the, in this extraordinary environment of women in the, in the court. She wanted to maintain, she's wearing a Burmese style sarong, she wanted to maintain her Chiang Mai position and part of that was through her hairstyle, you know, the, the retaining the hair. And of course, I mean, you could say that it's, it was a good thing that Chul Long Kho didn't make her cut her hair. But sometimes also for kings having a display of this ethnic diversity in their court was a good a good thing, you know, to have lots of people around wearing different dress that showed all the different countries and ethnicities that you, you control. Uh, but you can see other styles too. This again is from West New Guinea. Different ways of doing your hair. So uh, people in West New Guinea, of course, this is from the early 20th century, but they would use clay and sticks to make their hairs into hair into a certain style. And the next picture shows men from different parts of, of uh, Dutch New Guinea with different hairstyles that belong to different communities. So you could tell by looking at these men's hair um, where, which community they were, they were coming from. But it was all done with, with clay and with dirt and with sticks and so forth too. So the hair became a very um, important site of of decoration. Uh, let's turn now to jargons as, as, uh, as a kind of a contrast because the Konde here, this bun, has long been a very significant sign of, well you have to, if you wear Japanese dress you don't have a Konde. Uh, most people nowadays have their hair short so you can buy buy the Conde everywhere, so to, to put them on. But um, you show you show your status in your hair by the different kinds of, this is uh, the bridal, by the way you, you dress the hair at the front, by the, the bridal decorations, or generally speaking as the status uh, in, in among the ch overseas Chinese in Malaysia, for example, the, the women in Malacca, wore different style hairpins for women in Penang, so you could tell where they, where, what particular um, city they came from. 
But of course, for Muslims, covering the hair has most recently become um, particularly important as, a, as an indication of religiosity. When I taught in the University of Malaya in 1970, nobody wore the headscarf. It just wasn't wasn't there. But now it's become an item of fashion, and you can you can see here that. Um, so this is a, a guide to wearing the headscarf in the in a new fashion, so it just says ready here. Uh, so this is all the, 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 the people. But you can buy books on how to, to, um, to tie hair in different ways. And there's a whole new industry in the jewelry that goes with the headscarf, with the pins that, that people put in their headscarf. I, I'm amazed when I go to markets now. It's, it's mostly produced in China, I have to say. Um, but, but all these, these decorations that have brought about to, for aesthetics, for fashion, but also for showing identity. Because uh, what, what, um, in Singapore, where I taught last year, some of the, it's not mandatory, I mean, the pressure to wear the headscarf is not so great among Muslim girls. But, um, but one person said to me, when I put on my hijab, when I put on the tukul, I feel, I feel a different person. I feel I'm you know, showing who I belong to. And so, um, so heads are important. But as I said yesterday, it's not something, it's not, it's not something that's just happened just, uh, recently. Uh, and Europeans also made a change. Because when Europeans came to Southeast Asia, they brought all kinds of ideas about dress. They had very quite strict, sumptuary rules about how many buttons you could have on your coat. And the U Europeans were also very concerned with status. And one of those concerned hip, hip covered hair. And so Europeans were allowed to wear European style hats. The what kind of hat you wear, the way you did your hair, um, remember the, 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 the Manchu attitudes towards head shading and so forth in China. The, the way you did uh, um, your hair and the way you covered your head was an important sign of identity. So you could see in this picture an Eurasian man, descended from the, Marit, from the liaisons between Portuguese and local women, who was allowed to wear a European style, um, uh, style hat. And <clears throat> These people were called the topas. The topas is in, uh, for the black Portuguese. The topas just means the hat people. They, they, they were known as, as these, um, um, the belief is that it came from talking somehow via India, but uh, derivations are disputed, but they are often just called the hat people. And uh, a Malay poem I was interested to read talks about this. Ana uh, Pabini, this, this Portuguese descendant person, is wearing his hat with a jaunty angle and a feather in it and so forth. So this is an important sign of, of identity which was much prized. And Europeans in the, the colonial Europeans often describe how people will come out with some battered old hat that they had from their, their grandfather. But it's still a very important sign of of their connection to a colonial power. And uh, in Malaysia, which is, is one of the places I'm more, more, they're more familiar with, every royal family, every state royal family has their own way of trying, tying the nesta, the, 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 the turban, the modified turban. And there's a whole, I didn't call all the um, stamps up here, but there are stamps for every every state for the royal family of every state and they're quite distinctive. I mean they, they don't be able to muddle them up. So you know you know for this is this Perak. Perak is in one of the old state, um, uh, from Kedar, uh, from the Greece of Bieland, from Kingani, Klantan and so on. So but the, these these specific ways of tying your um just out and up just as a did, I was at the uh, the celebrations for the, for the 50th anniversary of Malaysia in 2007, 
So it was 50 years since independence in 1957. So, um, because my husband and I had written the history of Malaysia, they gave us a good seat. And, but behind us, <laughs> the behind us were all the sultans from all the states with all their desktops in this, in, all like this. And I, 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 had, I couldn't turn around. <laughs> I, wa I wanted to take a picture of them all, you know, because each one was there exactly like this with their... Um, so it's, again, you know, headgear here is, a, is, is an important sign of showing your identity. And I just thought this was interesting from, from central Vietnam. These are, this is, these are charm people from the central Vietnam, most of the Muslim country. See the variety of headgear in that community, the, the, the imams, um, the, this woman with her earrings, but then you can see a couple of people wearing Western style um, hats. There's no one similar, similar to over here, I noticed the, the other day, that they're wearing, uh, so that people have, can display their own originality in these, um, in, these, in the way that they're wearing their heads. So this is uh, another imam in, a, in uh, wearing the, this, the ritual headgear. So hair, head decoration, um, becomes a very significant way of, of showing your identity. Now I'd like to turn to a second thing. So I'll so finish with the head. We can dispense with the, dispense with the head. <laughs> so so um, I'd like to turn to the skin. Of course, coming from Hawaii, tattooing and, and things is very much part of the local tradition, but it's also gaining, gaining, um, gaining connections elsewhere, gaining some kind of uh, popularity, you might say, perhaps. But when the Filipino, when the Spanish first came to the, the Philippines, they remarked on the on the represent on the degree to which local people um, mark their skin, and of course that has clear ramifications, clear resonance with with Hawaii uh, and with Maori culture as well, with the Polynesian culture generally, where where the use of tattooing was not only aesthetic but also a mark of status and so on. And there have been a lot of interest in in the, this is a six, from a 16th century manuscript of Oxford Codex. Um, and one of the few pictures we really have of, of contemporary pictures. So how accurate it is, we don't know. The use of, uh, uh, as I'm sure Paul will agree, the use of illustrations for reconstructing historical accuracies is, is very dubious. But nonetheless, this is interesting. Uh, particularly because of the design, some people some authorities think you know, it's possible that they were these floral designs, which are quite hard to do in terms of tattooing. Um, these floral designs are copied from Chinese ceramics that may have come into the air. It's possible. Um, or, or they may have some other der derivation. People have looked at the more triangular ones and seen similarities with cloth and with textiles so that the, the, um, the textiles become um, a better way of, of uh, another way of transferring to the body, lessening the borders between human being and what you what you wear. The, um, so this is part of these larger connections to the Pacific world. But I look, I'd like to look particularly at the Iban of Borneo, who are very well known for their tattoo tradition. Because what Europeans didn't realise when they first saw these pintados, these painted people, what they didn't realise was that these, all these tattoos meant something. They were saying something about the person. And of course, if you look at tattoos, not tattoos, people go into the shop and get tattoos and they have to choose what they want, a mother or whatever they wanted or hearts or whatever their girlfriend or I don't know what happens when the relationship breaks up but anyway <laughs> my, my son-in-law has my daughter's name tattooed across his back so it's Mark from the line. Um, so, so you have to choose but they tell, tell a story about and 
these, these tattoos all have significance. And in the past, of course, the more tattoos you had the, for a man, among the Yiban in particular, the more achievements you would be made. And this particular tattoo here, most the most painful on the, the neck to do the tattoo here. But it is the mark of somebody who's taken a head. So this was a head hunting society. So when you've taken a head, then then you were entitled to have these, these tattoos. The, 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 the supreme mark of manhood, in other words. And but tattoos, though to a lesser extent, were also among women too. And you'll see that the woman's hands on the, the textiles at the at the side, she has tattoos up, up the side of her wrist. Women also have tattoos around their face too. But this tattoo up the wrist had particular significance because it was the mark of a master wounder. Only the women who were able to weave these enormous poor cloth that were um, specially designed cloth which received the heads when they were brought in from the raid. So the women would stand at the top of the stairs leading into the head into the into the longhouse with the poor cloth and the victorious warriors would come in with their heads and present them to the cloth. And women who could weave that remarkable design, they had all in their heads. It's not like they're sitting there with Knit one, pearl one, or whatever it is, you know. That they, they know it all. They, they conceive the design before it ever happens. And then they were designed to have this, this, this design. And weaving, therefore, for Iban women was the war path, the women's war path. Um, so, um, but in other places too, in Southeast Asia, so this enables, if you think about the skin as a site of decoration, then it enables you to think across these often problematic island mainland divisions, which are perhaps even more pervasive um, academically than nation-state divisions. It's very, very hard to teach Southeast Asia in total because it's such a complicated area and students find it so hard. So one of the easiest ways and one of the specialisations is to specialise on it and concentrate on the island or concentrate on the mainland. It's very hard sometimes to bridge that, that, that difference. But you can see here that in tattooing, which was very prevalent in, um, especially among the upland Thai-speaking groups, and uh, the Burmese all tattooed their legs way in, until recently. And as this is a manual for tattooing on the on the right, which they are often animals. So it's, tattooing could be protective as well, not just a sign of achievement, but also it could protect you from harm. So men going into battle would these these tattoos that they have would protect them from from danger. And there's this Chin woman, is the uh, Highland group from um, Myanmar as well. This this um, this network of of tattoos across their their face was a sign of female adulthood and beauty as well. Um, I was in one of the chin areas about ten years ago, and um, I, I, I did have some gifts, but I'd given them all away. And there were three chin women who were very kind to me, and I just had nothing to give them. And I did have some like six dollar earrings that had a bit of fake gold and of course they assumed it was real gold so so I I gave them the, these earrings so they were three them and then so they waved me goodbye and three of them like that with my one of them was wearing my 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 fake gold earrings you know I, I wish I had a picture of it but anyway um, but the already in the 18th century you can find comments from Burmese saying, I would not ever marry a woman who tattoos. So ugly. So already there's a sign of association of facial tattoos with ugliness and ethnic inferiority. And that is still, an, in fact, the, the junta, the previous Burmese government, government, military government, forbade any more facial tattooing a few years ago. 
And what, what that kind of proverb, I don't know whether it's observed or not, but what it means is that in that tradition, the government has said you could never proclaim yourself as a complete woman for that society, because that's what the facial tattoos meant to them, that they become, they were ready for childbearing, they were ready for um, entry onto the to motherhood and, and being complete women. Uh, and of course we, the, the, the decoration of the face with Kwanaka from this, this root vegetable is often conceived of being um, uniquely, uniquely Burmese, whether it is uniquely being Burmese or or not is a different matter, but uh, it, because it is spilling now, is Burmese migration spilling over into Thailand, you can find it there, I've even seen it in Cambodia as well, but this idea of, face, of, of decorating the skin with this as a form of, um, of purifying the skin, of, of cleansing the skin, but also uh, you can see here, the way this film is done, as a decoration as well. She hasn't just smeared the, this woman has just wore it, smeared it on, but these girls have, have done it into a you know, facial decoration. So, again, um, the whole way of, of decorating the skin, particularly tattooing, which I've looked at here, it has different connotations in different societies. In Japan, Japan tattooing is so associated with Yakuza. There was a, a case recently of a Hawaiian woman who was kind of refused entry into something to have a tattoo, and they, this, the, 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 the people arranging this regarded it as associating with Yakuza. But I see with my Filipino students, there's a real revival. Um, I had a student in my, in my room the other day, he wanted to write on tattooing. And when he found that I was interested, he said, well, I won't take off my shirt, because if I did, you'd find that I'd, hold, I'd, end, I'd copy those designs. He's a designer, so he'd copy the designs from the boxer, the boxer um, uh, picture that I showed you earlier, you tried to replicate them. And there's a whole uh, group uh, located in, in California that's trying to promote this among young Filipinos. Interestingly enough, led by a German, <laughs> but it's it's really um, gaining a lot, of, quite a lot of traction among uh, among some of the young females. So uh, I looked at heads, I looked at the skin, and now I look like to look at the most obvious form of, of representing yourself in terms of dress and, and textiles. And of course, Southeast Asia has um, just an amazing textile tradition. Just an amazing. Textile. And um, really, it's only been truly investigated properly, I think, since the 1980s. When it, before that, um, there really were, wasn't very much, but now Southeast Asian textiles are, are very big news. But it's not, we have to remember that, that um, textiles or representation have, a, have everywhere, worldwide, where people made their own clothes, they represented communities. So I went to the Quilting Museum yesterday, and, and of course there are Amish textiles, you, uh, Amish quilts there. You can recognise people who quilt, uh, 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 specialists will recognise an Amish quilt immediately by the kind of colours. But um, the, the, they told me that, I, I, I'm not a specialist, but they, this kind of star pattern, this is particularly associated with New England, and there's actually a book of Massachusetts, Massachusetts quilts that's associated with, particularly with star design. And then you can see what happened when New England missionaries came to Hawaii and developed these Hawaiian quilting, which is also immediately recognized, these Hawaiian quilts. Very, very definite style of its own. So, um, Textiles happening of, of has has a history elsewhere, but in Southeast Asia there's just so there's so much I can talk about um, because in non-literate societies textiles like the body, like the head, have an enormous potential for telling a story and a, uh, 
claiming identity, uh, presenting status, all kinds of things that you can say with the clothes that you wear. And let's, I'll just take a few examples. So this is Javanese Baptic. So it's, you can see this woman practicing the old technique with waxing, and you, you, you all know how it works. You uh, cover, the colors that, cover, the, cover the area that you do not wish to dye with wax, and you dye it, and then you have to take it out and uncover those areas and recover and dye it again. So it's a very long and arduous uh, procedure, but what I want to say is, or the point that I want to make, say is that designs were very, very carefully guarded in the past. You know, the, the, certain people could wear certain designs, and the men in the, on the right-hand side of the picture are all wearing uh, designs that are exclusive, exclusive to servants of the court, of the judge. Could not, absolutely could not wear any of those designs when you were outside. In fact, the Sultanate of Jokja absolutely prohibited, these are two of the designs, that it, even as late as this was in 1935, he pro, as late as that, it was absolutely prohibited for anybody outside the immediate royal family, not, not, not court servants, but immediate royal servants, to wear these um, uh, this parangusa, this broken, broken sword pattern, or this udang liris, these, these lines here, to wear either of those patterns. Now you can go to any shop, you can go to any shop in Seoul or Jokja and buy a shirt in any of those designs. They're not. Um, but that's been a very recent phenomenon. And, so, and when we look at, at this commercialization, you could see here this um, parangusa design. Here, the same one here that previously, you know, 70 years ago, was absolutely only for the Sultan and his wife and children. Now, as I said, anybody can buy a, um, a shirt with it, and there is these modern modern designs that have um, have no particular meaning at all. It's just it's pleasing. And cheap batik, cheap Javanese batik circulates throughout the entire region, sometimes even amazingly undercut in Chinese cloth. But you can, uh, you can go down to the wards in, in, in Nangon or you can see it find it in circulating Laos as well as this, this very cheap cloth. But the commercialization of batik loses, so we've lost that association between cloth and identity. It's fading away, but it was very important in the past. Now I'm turning to Sumba, one of the islands in eastern Indonesia, which is also a headhunting society. And you can see here the, on the cloth here, these are all, this is the, the tree on which the Andul tree, uh, which is ficus, um, the angle on which the heads of the, uh, of the victims were, were hung when they were, were returned home. And men would go into battle wearing the, um, the unknown cloth. So that was a, their battle. Because, said one, one, uh, one old man told a recent researcher, people were afraid, they were terrified when they saw us wearing the unborn cloth. Because the cloth itself, the cloth itself was imbued with power that was transferred to the wearer as well. But it made them part of a, not only a community of warriors, but a part of, a, of an ethnic group. And these, um, uh, these, these, Cloths here, so this weaving tradition is still very much alive. It's just absolutely amazing. But you can see here that some of these these modified um, lions, for example, were adopted from European coats of arms. So they, even though the lion has an old history, also representation in much of Southeast Asia, it we've got an added impetus. Some, we, somebody was asking this morning about the influence of Europeans, and you can see it here. Sometimes 
women would take uh, the OC, the signs of the Dutch East India Company. Of course, they couldn't read it, but they would copy these signs and put them into the the OC in the middle of their of their cloth because that also gave gave power to the wearer. Um, Central Sumatra, the Venenka Valley, we looked at these houses yesterday when I, oh, yes, last night, um, and I, I commented that some people think they, they, they come from this boat tradition. Another story is that they are associated with the buffalo horns. The Venenka Valley means victorious buffalo. And so it, it is linked with the stories of how the Menenka Bauer can always defeat, particularly the Japanese, they can always defeat other ethnic groups because they have this buffalo, this young buffalo who runs into the ferocious tiger or whatever it was with his little horns and pierces the tiger in the, uh, in the stomach and wins. So the, the idea of the victorious buffalo, the Menenka Bauer, is very much associated with this group. Nobody else in Indonesia would wear headwear like that. That is absolutely the think about, and the idea that the, the head here is representing the, the horns of the buffalo is, um, of course, very deeply rooted in their society. But things can change also, too, here in Aceh, in northern Sumatra, um, a very traditional appearing uh, dress, but as you know, there's, it's, it's one of the areas where there's been um, much more strongly Islamic. Uh, prohibitions in terms of dress. So you can see here, this, this is uh, what you should not wear, and this is what you should wear. Um, but people make their own variations on that too. This is a, um, by the Arche, a recent a fashion show showing how you could be well dressed as a Muslim woman, but follow the, the, um, the government's expectations, but still be fashionable as well. So dress Codes or dress representations can can change, and as I showed in Malaysia, these women are still showing that they can't. In a religious community, their religiosity is very clear, but they can still be Ashmans as well. And West New Guinea has, as, as the hairstyles I showed earlier, have also have, have had these very distinctive um, dress associations. With um, birds, these bird feathers. What is particularly amazing, David Attenborough went there in the 60s and made a film and they've sort of redone that, for, he did it for the National Geographic and they've redone that again just recently. But these, these birds, this has nothing to do with community representation, it's just bird, bird communities, but I just think it's interesting. These birds, um, they they find, they find trees that are, are um, leaf, very leafless, with broad limbs, and they, they dance, the birds dance, there. the male birds dance, and the females gather in a circle around them to watch. And the birds, it's amazing to see pictures of how the birds dance, they, like, like this, you know, sort of. <laughs> but, but in the tribal groups, when the dancers are also, women also dance, like, like this. They're mimicking the birds, this relationship between animal, the animal bird life and, and human life is, is very close. So, so um, again, it's, it's, it's off our topic for a while, but I, the whole world, I was thinking this morning when Paul was talking about the relationship between animals and birds and human beings, that kind of crossover. Do you create the barriers between them or do you emphasize the connections? So as we saw in the Balinese case, people are emphasizing the difference between us and animals through their teeth. But in this case, they're making the connection between the beauty of the birds and their, their ability to fly and human beings themselves. Um, and then, uh, just a couple more, these are from that. Highland, the Kachin Highlands, this uh, Myanmar, you can see here in Laos, this, this uh, the woman is, she's, she's chewing beetle, but she's, you know, no lowland Thai woman would be dressed like this, and this is clearly, clearly um, uh, uh, 
the highlands, but you can see how it's changing somewhat with the younger generation. So whether younger women will choose to dress like that, except in the hopes of tourism, is a, um, is a question. And what we have to remember too is that this, these Kachin groups, um, this is a representation of Chinese, uh, 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 upper, upper representation from I think the early 19th century, but um, there are different groups within the Kachin, and so they dress in different ways, so within that larger community you would find smaller groups as well. The, the Jirai and Abana from central Vietnam, again, no lowland Vietnamese would ever dress like this, or decorate their tombs in this way either, which have ancestors, um, animal figures, all kinds around them. Uh, and dress, as I showed earlier, can display, I just have a couple of slides in um, English. Dress can display religious piety. So on the left hand side, you see Indonesian Christians from the 19th century whose black, somber dress. Their Bibles clearly indicates their Christian status, but also what's interesting is these pointy shoes. That was also a sign of being a Christian. It's very in that area. Uh, one woman doesn't have any shoes, but these people do. Um, and where that came from, I have no idea. But a, 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 a Thai nun, a Muslim woman from the southern Philippines, you can see the, the hat there. No Christian Filipino would be dressed like that. So they're clearly identifying their community. But as I've been constantly suggesting as we've been talking, that, that in all societies, changing times um, can bring a lot of changes in, in representation. So I love this picture from, from New Guinea where the man still has his nose here on, but he's got a shirt and trousers on, but you can see here in, uh, in early 20th century Indonesia these uh, Javanese, ethnic Javanese students at the School for Native Civil Servants, so they're still wearing the sarongs that show their ethnic status, but they are wearing western style jackets and ties um, that show their association with western education and going and being able to speak Dutch and go to a Western style school. Sometimes, sometimes these kinds of changes can bring can bring some angst to societies. You know how um, there's there's a lot of debate in many societies. How far can you go along this road of changing? And even in the, in the 17th century, there's a very nice quote from a Javanese uh, a Javanese chronicle when one of the Javanese kings is wearing a jacket, sort of like this, I mean, a 17th century jacket, with his, in a time when Javanese kings, prior to that, would be bare-chested. So now he's covered up his chest with his Dutch jacket. So the Javanese chronicle says, well, he, the, the, our, our king, he's sitting on his throne but he looks just like a Dutchman. Now, there's no way that the, the, the Japanese would just, just like a Dutchman. But um, that is the way that the, the covering of the chest, the wearing of the chronicle, and the wearing of the jacket for this chronicler for uh, such, such anxiety that you could say that he observed from afar, he looks like the governor general and not like a king of Java sitting on his throne. And the same, same anxiety occurs in Malay society in the 19th century when men started wearing trousers and shoes and so that they, they don't look Malay anymore, says the chronicler. They, they, they look too Western. So, um, and here I think this is a nice photo from Tanimba in Indonesia where the old style um, leader and his son, but you can see the son has still got his feathers in his, where his, his feathers, the, the previous mark of, of, of status in his hat. But these changes still occur. So, um, 
one final one I stuck in. The, the, this is from Burma with the, this English style haircut for Bokeh, the English style haircut as a as, as particularly for men is being promoted here in this 1935 journal, modern hairstyles for both men and women, but particularly for men, this, this short hairstyle cut. And you can see here in this one from Solo so, so in Central Java, so he's got this military style uniform. They often made lots of medals of their own just <laughs> to put on there that, that, were, that were just, and his wife is still wearing traditional clothing, to, but their daughter is dressed in the in, in Western style. So, uh, and it's truly this my final side. So I think the, the remarkable evidence of that is, is Kui Bon, who was Prime Minister of Thailand in 1938, and he issued a lot of decrees regarding Thai dress. And Thais were told at that time that they should wear Western style coat, trousers, shirt and tie for men, skirts and blouses, hat and gloves for women. Everybody should wear shoes. So this was a, a sign of Thailand now as a nation state. So this was all Thai shoes. You're marking yourself in, in, this, in this thinking. Thais would now be marked as modern, as part of a nation, as part of a globalizing, a globalizing world. The, the story is too, he, he told husbands that they should kiss their wives when they left the house as well. So <laughs> that whether they do that or not, I don't know. So uh, in conclusion then that <coughs> Southeast Asia is an incredibly complicated area. I've been teaching the region now for quite a long time and I still haven't mastered the art of that conveying that regional variety and getting to generalizations that are not so simplified that they're wrong. It's, it's not easy, it's a real challenge, but for me that's part of the interest. And one of the ways we've got around that complexity is to teach by country, because it's what people understand. But as both Paul and I have been trying to say to you, teaching by country, it is probably the easiest way. But we have to work hard to make students see that the, these nation-state boundaries are porous. Uh, they were often very recently create, created. And more importantly, they don't necessarily have a great deal of meaning to people on the ground, except in circumstances like Reva or people may be generated to thinking of themselves as part of a nation-state. It's, but family and community don't necessarily correlate with nation states. I think as, as Jan was saying yesterday, that, that, that uh, uh, people in Malaysia and Indonesia and the Borneo areas feel puzzled by the fact that they're fa connected by family but provided by nationality. So when we think of mapping um, Southeast Asia through identities and communities, rather than simply approaching Southeast Asia through nations. It may be one way of looking at the variety and difference um, that makes the region, I think, so incredibly interesting. But it also might be a way that you can engage student interests too, because everybody can understand the idea of using your personhood as a way of <coughs> accessing a community. And so I think in that process, as we see this, this movement from family, village, town, community, into nationhood, we can see, help students understand that it's not necessarily an inevitable process and that it can be quite complicated in the way that people learn to think of themselves as part of a nation rather than simply a member of a community or um, a village system. So I'll stop there now. We've got um, some time for questions. Thank you. We have time for questions. Yes.
a, that's a, a very good point, I think, in a globalising world. Um, yes, the extent to which identity is revived or recreated or uh, uh, dispensed with as people move from one culture to another. So I think it can depend. I mean, in some places, it's an opportunity to people, people to feel more identified with their community than they did before. I know I've spoken to um, a colleague I met from, went to South Africa, and she said, you know, I went never, well, obviously I'm a Hindu, but I never been, did anything sort of Hinduish before I went to South Africa. And I do a lot now, because she wants to feel part of that, that community. And in the, uh, when Malaysia instituted the National Economic Policy to help Malays study overseas, many, Malay students came back much more, quote unquote, Malay than they were when they went away. So I think it depends. You know, sometimes people can become more, so they can want to revive their identity. Um, and we saw it with the uh, dance encore yesterday. I mean, there's a real concern to, uh, to recreate those roots. And sometimes people just want to merge, they just want to forget about it, they just want to be the same as, as everyone else, so they're not interested in that. Even internally within countries, I like in, in, in Chum society now, in, in, uh, for a long time in Vietnam, nobody could study in the Chum, so it's kind of the Vietnamese government were not interested in, in looking at, at Chum society because they're afraid of uh, separatism or but now it's kind of the flavour of the month. So lots of people are working on charms and studying charm societies and it's, it's, they have charm conferences. And, um, and the, the situation of the charm in Cambodia is particularly difficult because they're a group that you know, was targeted by the Khmer Rouge and, and, and suffered a lot during that period. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 but even internally, another another example of that internal regeneration: the Portuguese in Malaya in Malaysia, because Portuguese people descended from Portuguese in Malaysia, largely in Malacca, uh, they're still Catholic. Uh, they speak a, a, a patois, which is sort of you can't if you you can't recognise it as Portuguese, but it's not Malay either. Um, and now they're trying to revive their culture, so they've made a company of Portuguese, and you can go there, and there are all these people doing Portuguese folk dances that were never there. I mean, they were never part of that black Portuguese and a pretty culture, but they're being kind of revived. So it's an ongoing thing, uh, uh, ongoing, I think, this association with ident identity and what you want to do. And, and you're right, mobility and migration can change that, and it can emphasise it or can downplay it. Um, what do you think? You know, that, that is true, uh, because uh, there's all my research in the Asian side of the Chinese community. So I can uh, see... Can, can you hear at the back? Yeah. Uh, could you see? Yeah, this is true, uh, because based on my field work in Malaysia and Thailand on the Chinese community, like migrants, uh, and um, because there's one common thing they emphasize more on religious identity than like Muslim. Mm -hmm. Muslim is very important than the expression of the Islam, uh, like mm -hmm. the show in picture. Um, they more the different things. So this small group that still stay there, I think identity uh, is very similar to those in Islam. But in, in general, uh, you can see that when you ask them to identify the identity, what, how we identify itself, uh, they will say Muslim is a different number. Yes, so, so the, the um, Priya right? yeah. was saying that, that um, for Cham Muslims, because Chams were in Vietnam and they also lived in Zero, also a Cambodian group too, which is more is in self divided the charms in Cambodia, but uh, but they, they, for them the most more important ethnic 
identity is, is, is Islam, as being Muslim rather than being Shah. And so sometimes when people have cross-cutting community identity, they could choose which, and they may be doing that because Islam is more important to them, or it may be because they feel that the person they're speaking to will understand being Muslim rather than Charm. I mean, most people have, don't know who Charm are. Um, or it may be that they feel that being Islam is more prestigious. You know, there could be multiple reasons why they choose to, yeah, their motivations for for choosing that particular identity. Jan, Jan, what do you think? Yeah, well, just kind of um, following from that, I got found it very confusing that sometimes the same identity seemed like it was dangerous or it was desirable, mm -hmm. right? So um, I'm thinking, for example, um, in Indonesia there was a period where you couldn't be Chinese, mm -hmm. right? The government outlaws Chinese language and newspapers and dress and schools and right, all of the um, elements of China that, that it can eradicate, really. And, so um, there's an artist named um, Christian uh, Didano, I think it's his name, Didano. And he did the, his father was um, rounded up by the police in Indonesia and never seen again. And the thinking is that he was beheaded on almost 70,000 other people like this, right? So, um, and in the same country, there's, um, of this tourist market for culture, Chinese culture. You can go to the um, Zhenghe temple and dress up like a Chinese person and get your photograph taken. It's so confusing that there are these sort of same things going on. In this well, when well, you're speaking of phalanx of historians, <laughs> so you know, the only way you could really answer these questions, I think, is to think of historical context and what it actually means. And as far as Indonesia and the Chinese are concerned, of course, the Chinese um, came as largely as poor migrants, and largely, although well, there are older communities, largely in the 17th century, but there were communities beforehand. But they've had a very problematic relationship with Indonesians because so much of the wealth came into their hands, or they acted as agents for the colonial powers, or they gained, they became Christians, or they gained education. So there were many people who intermarried with Indonesians and were Pranakan. Um, but there was a new Sinicization process in the early 20th century where people became proud of being Chinese. It was more possible to get brides from China, so you didn't have to marry local women. Um, in the late 18th century, some Indonesian women married Chinese with them binding their feet to make themselves more Chinese. So there have been different, pro different at various points of time, you know, Chinese can have high status or low status, but the particular, the particular prohibitions that you've mentioned really occurred in 60, 60, after 65, because for Chinese in Malaysia, the, the big problem is communism in China itself. And once the being Chinese was associated with Chinese communism. That was seen as a real threat. And many Chinese did go back home. They were inspired. I mean, again, I think if you're teaching the 1920s and 30s, one of the big things is to, communism is such a bad word these days, especially in the United States. You know, it's just really difficult to teach it without this baggage. But you've got to get kids, this was inspiring to many people, especially people like you, you know, 20, 30, year, 25 years old, they're inspired by this new idea of equality and, and, and lack of privilege and so on. Um, so, so many Chinese did go back, but when, when the, when the um, internal rebellion in, in Indonesia occurred in 65, you had to find a scapegoat you couldn't say it was left-wing colonels in the Indonesian army who were mounting a coup, which is what it was. Um, you couldn't say that. So the communists were blamed instead. So it was the communist party that was trying to take over the states. Communists had a heavy Chinese influence, ergo Chinese 
women traders. So it was that kind of government promoted propaganda that led to the death of who knows how many Chinese, the destruction of buildings, even though they're only 5% of the population. But, but since that time, of course, China has regained a different status. Now it's seen, now you can actually put Confucian on your ID card as a religion, even though it's not a religion, but you can put it on as a religion, officially sanctified religion. And so being Chinese is more acceptable now than it was before. So there's been this revival of temples and, as you say, dressing up and being looking, and people are less concerned about it. Although it's still, um, I had a student, an Indonesian Muslim student, who was doing research on Chinese schools a couple of years ago. And um, some of the schools were very nervous about why are you asking these questions? Why do you want this information about us? They saw her as some sort of government spy mm. because they remembered what had happened in 65 when many Chinese lost everything. They had a high school education they could not afford their kids high school. You know, so Sorry, that's a long answer, but I think it's, it's, it's you've got to think historically mm. if you have to see those kind of conundrums. But to just expand on that, about well, it's been 20 years ago, I was doing business with a, a company in uh, in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. That uh, if you looked at the owner, you could not tell that there was any link to China in there. But somewhere back in his, way back, there was a thread of Chinese ethnics. And at that time, 20 some odd years ago. Um, the whole family had to carry identification cards that clearly marked them as Chinese, even though if you looked at their features and their language, there was no clue. Uh, and then it would just be found that China and Chinese became acceptable. But now they have regular ID cards. But I happen to know that in addition to their official documents they have the whole family has another set of documents under a completely different set of names in anticipation of the clock turning and then they will be unacceptable so then they can revert to this other set of documentation and get out of Indonesia quick um, and I know well I'm told I don't know I'm told there's a substantial bank account in Singapore for that day when the political real turns and they have to get out of Dodge. Yes. Um, so I, I'm really glad you raised that. I'm sorry, what's your name? Oh, uh, Cecil Lambert. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry, yes. sorry. So, so I'm really glad you raised that point because I think I've been presenting a fairly positive picture, but identity can have a very dark side as well, mm -hmm. and, and memories don't die easily. And in fact, they often expand over time. So things that actually didn't happen are, are thought to have happened in the in, in memory. And um, I'm sure the family that you're describing is is very pragmatic. I mean, that's one reason for Chinese survival. They they're always prepared. They under, they obey. They try and obey the rules where they're living. But they understand. They understand this this kind of situation, and they're. Um, I think it probably, I hope it will never happen again, but I think they're very wise to keep that option open. And it's not fair, it's not fair but to have that, that visit on the, that connection in the past somehow punished. Well, the, the, uh, the gentleman of the family, uh, when he would be relaxed, he'd always say, you know, I wouldn't be so offended if I look Chinese, but you know, it really pisses me off that nobody can tell that there's any Chinese blood in my veins, but yet I have to carry these, uh, yeah. what you used to have to carry special. I really want, I wonder how, because people don't keep genealogy, so I wonder, I mean, the officials wouldn't have kept genealogy, so how did they know that there was, you know, it's, sometimes there was, people used that, those things to kind of report yeah. somebody that they had a difference with, um, and and people were targeted as being Chinese that really weren't, or 
uh, or people try to protect themselves by writing Prigumi, by native Indonesian on their doors. So even though they were well, I didn't even know this this whole situation existed until we were leaving Indonesia and we were headed for Singapore. And as we were he gave us the money to take. Um, he, he was upheld by the, the border okay. people for special questioning about why he was going to Singapore. They went through his luggage with a, which was very little, because we were just gonna go for a couple of days. They went through anything he had with a fine tooth comb to see if he was carrying extra money. Uh, and I was I was puzzled. But uh, but what we also being, I being, being a smart fellow, uh, I immediately saw that the authorities were really interested in him, so I got as far away from him as I could get <laughs> and got through to the other side before they decided to start asking me to make questions. But I think it's also an opportunity to, you know, I think there's a tendency that we think in the West that Western are different. We, we treat income, we don't treat them with suspicion, we don't check their bags at the airport or anything like that. And that's rubbish, you know. That, um, so, I mean, especially with your, your students, your heritage, your students who, they, they've probably got lots of stories about the kind of experiences they had in terms of identity and mobility and good things and bad things. So I think that there's um, there's not an opportunity for self-reflection too in 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 the way you're talking to students. Oh even even in China itself when I used to go there, uh, I would give my business association a lot of uh, bad time because they had to go through so much trouble to even get on an airplane within China. Now they're turn it around and when they come to the US they give me a bad time because they say, hey, it's easier to travel in China now than it is in the US. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, um, I, the, the last couple of questions made me wonder if there are any examples that you can share of um, these status markers clothing, um, body modification, hairstyles that are being um, imposed uh, to exclude, to oppress. Because, um, as you said, you presented a fairly positive you know, like, you know, story in the direction of multiculturalism is problematic. Is that maybe I'm sort of there? Oh, I think there are many. I think there are plenty. Um, um, of course, in Cambodia, of course, you've got some prime examples of Khmer Rouge, but uh, in Vietnam, the treatment of the charm, they, they were required to wear Vietnamese dress, and so when the Burmese took Chiang Mai, the Chiang Mai people were supposed to be required, even to the extent of um, Burmese had, they used to have ear earplugs of sort of folded bamboo, and the Chiang Mai people were supposed to, women were supposed to wear these kind of, yeah, so indeed, I think um, there is an imposition, but often it's not just the mean, um, often, even with the Khmer Rouge, I mean, there is, they have a vision of some kind of community that they're trying to create, and appearance is part of that community. So for your own good, and to create this community, you might not like it, but we have to compel you to be part of this identity. Um, I mean, in, in, in the 1930s, in Western society, in terms of assimilation of minority groups like the Native American or the Maoris New Zealand, there was a very strong feeling in schools, we must not let children speak their language. Yes. We have to get them to speak yes. English. They have to, it's for their yes. good. And, and do all those things, yes. But these people who were enforcing these were not nasty people necessarily. They were imposing, but they had a, a, a vision. So it's even imposition has a kind of can have should be nuanced, I think, because it doesn't always it may look awful, but and be much resented. But the motivations may not may not be so evil, or. There may, there may be something else behind it. Somebody said, 